Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Respected chairpersons, my seniors and uh, colleagues, greetings from Chandigarh. At the foreset, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Vijaypal Kanagwal and his team for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, share my views. I have been asked to talk about super speciality in forensic medicine and toxicology, options, scope, and utility. I have searched the literature and have found nothing. So whatever I'm going to speak will be my own views. So please bear with me. Now, since we are going to talk about the super speciality in forensic medicine, its scope, utility, let's first see what is the utility of forensic medicine in the society at large. We all know that forensic medicine as such is the application of knowledge of medicine and allied subjects to law for administration of justice. Medical jurisprudence is the application of various aspects of law to our day-to-day -day medicine practice. By the definition itself, forensic medicine is an all-encompassing field. And we cannot think of a single act that we do which does not involve forensic medicine in one way or the other. The air we breathe may be toxic, the water we drink may be adulterated, the food we eat may be adulterated. We might want to have compensation from the municipal corporation, from the administration, and for that we need a forensic opinion. For the vehicular or the day-to-day -day accident cases, assault cases, medical negligence cases, any other cases where we need either compensation or we need justice, we need a forensic expert. That, my dear friends, is the utility of this field or the importance of this field. But what have we as forensic people done for this subject? Nothing except for some instances here and there. We are discussing the scope and utility of super specialization, so I may be forgiven for expressing my views. I might be a bit harsh, but we have restricted ourselves only to conducting postmortem examinations. We do not do clinical forensic medicine. And even postmortem examinations, not many departments of forensic medicines do. In some institutes that I have inspected as an inspector for the Medical Council of India or for the NMC, I have seen departments of forensic medicine which do not perform medical legal postmortem examination or work, even though they have a full-fledged faculty, they have a well-equipped mortuary. They just open the door in the morning and close the door in the evening and GDMOs, non-medical forensic medicine, GDMOs from the area, they come and perform medical legal autopsies in those institutes. Even in primary health centers, secondary health centers, postmortem examinations are usually performed by MOs. They do it in a cursory, superficial way so as to complete the formality. And this leads to a number of mistakes, which makes us forensic people seem bad in the eyes of the law. As an inspector and as a forensic expert, I have even witnessed the so-called telephonic autopsies. Now let's talk about the mortuaries, our operation theaters. Way back in 2015, there was a public interest litigation in Delhi. It was against the condition of mortuaries in Delhi. The high court asked for pictures and it was shown the pictures of the instruments in the police mortuary at Sabji Mandi. And seeing those photographs, the Honorable Supreme High Court, it remarked, what people have to endure is disgusting. And apathy and the situation makes one want to resign and run away. Is there any SOP or screening process? You think mortuary belongs to the dead. So everything here should be dead. The people working there are also dying. These tools belong in museum. The dead cannot be butchered and hammered like this. The Tribune says the condition of mortuaries in Punjab is very poor. The Times of India says 
mortuary workers at the mortuaries at Bhagwati Hospital, Borivili, JJ, Baikula, Humpar, Juhu, and Rajwadi. They daily struggle to work in conditions where at every step, there is a risk of contracting infections like hepatitis, HIV, and tuberculosis. The Times of India revealed how at four different centers, there were 200 unidentified bodies in various stages of decomposition. Many corpses were lying wrapped, unwrapped on floors as the storage units had run out of space. If this is the condition of the mortuaries in most part of the countries, which is one of the basic requirements of any forensic medicine department, what can we talk about super specialization? The only way to prove our worth and presence is at first and foremost, do our best in improving the appalling condition of mortuaries of the country, do our work honestly and with sincerity so that we are able to make a niche for ourselves in the society. When the allocation of funds of an institute comes, forensic medicine department comes in one of the last entries. It usually, whatever funds are left by allocation to other units, the, unit, the Department of Forensic Medicine is allocated those. Now, we are also talking about another topic, which is very much in the view of Vogue nowadays, that is virtual autopsy or autopsy, as has been coined by Dr. Richard Dirnhoff. Everyone is talking about it, but few understand what actually forensic uh, autopsy is. Autopsy implies it is a uh, it's sort of uh, autopsy where you do not perform surgery on the body, where you do not open the body. You see, in, investigate the body through CTs, multi-layered CTs, MRIs, and then you arrive at a possible cause of death. You can also take FNACs from various organs and then come to a possible cause of death by those investigations. Well-funded departments are even in the process of establishing a part of the requisite machinery and equipment like digital X-ray, CT scan, etc. I do not know of any forensic medicine de department anywhere in India which has set up a dedicated MRI plant for this. For me, it is not justified at present. One of the most important reasons being monetary. The setup costs around five to six crores of rupees just for one single multi-slice CT. In a country where even basic amenities for the mortuaries are lacking, where the common man has to endure a lot of effort, harassment for simple investigations, talking about this kind of an um, expenditure for setting up what top C is not correct. Some nodal institutes, maybe like Ames Delhi or PGH Chandigarh, may be earmarked and the government funding can be done to develop them as centers of excellence. The second important reason why it is not justified at present is the procedure in itself. Who will take the multi CD films or the MRI films? We cannot, only a radiologist has to do. We also cannot interpret them. We cannot read them because we are not qualified radiologists. This again is the work of a radiologist. But a radiologist can write a postmortem report because he's an MBBS and therefore he's an RMP. But he cannot write a proper PMR, so we need a board. And in that board, the important person becomes a radiologist and not a forensic expert. And therefore, I think that this is another reason why at present, autopsy is not justified in our country. Let's talk about super specialization. I can think of DM in forensic toxicology as one of the important fields where we can super specialize. We do teach toxicology to both UGs and PGs. Of course, we do not practice it. The practicing part of the clinical toxicology is in the hands of the Department of Medicine, Pediatrics, or Emerging Medicine. However, we teach completely regarding poisons, their detection, clinical manifestations, treatment, postmortem findings, etc. And if we are given a chance, we can treat such cases. Initially, we might require the support of the Department of General Medicine or Anesthesia, but later on, we can do so on our own. And hence, we can think of 
forensic toxicology, a DM degree in forensic toxicology. The candidates during the DM, they can be posted for clinical part in various centers, <clears throat> ICUs, medicine, department of pediatrics, neonatology, anesthesia, community medicine, etc. They can also be sent to plastic surgery because uh, the corrosives are included and for corrosive treatment, we do require plastic surgery. They can also be sent to state or central forensic science laboratory for analysis part to become complete specialist. Since we are completely conservant with the, uh, conversant with the theory, if we brush up our practical knowledge and further specialize, we can be of good use to the society as forensic toxicologists. Since almost all hospitals deal with such cases, whether government or private, jobs can be created and super specialists can put their skill to use. They can open their own poison information and treating centers. Their domain would be emergency toxicology place, uh, cases, including life-saving intervention, treatment of adult pediatric neonatal cases of poisoning, et cetera, both in hospital and in community settings. Besides doing medical legal work related to the case, OPD basis treatment of follow-up cases, et cetera. Such a person would be a master trainer in the hospital settings or at district level or health center settings, or even in tertiary care hospitals. The, per, the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology in Raipur has started a DM course in medical and forensic toxicology. The eligible candidates for such a course are those who have MD in forensic medicine, MD in general medicine, MD in pediatrics, pharmacology, or emergency medicine. I know that some aims and at PGA, there are PhD courses in forensic toxicology but I'm not sure whether only an MD in forensic medicine or even a non-medical candidate can, take, uh, can pursue this course. If non-medical people pursue this course, then they cannot treat patients. And this course will then only remain academic, which might not serve much purpose to this society. The another topic that I can think of is DM in medical jurisprudence. <clears throat> This could include clinical forensic medicine. The candidate would be a master in medical negligence cases while also being an expert in supervising all medical legal examination by the Institute. He could be appointed by corporate hospitals, law firms dealing with such cases as he would be the person when it comes to litigation on account of medical negligence and related matters. He would be a master trainer in prevention of these cases protecting the hospital and doctors against litigation. He can also act as a district expert in dealing with such cases. Thorough law, uh, knowledge of law in relation to these cases should be included in the curriculum, posting in clinical departments, community medicine, attending courts in medical negligence cases should be included. He can be a trainer for newly appointed public prosecutors, judges, police officials, forensic science personnel, etc. The eligible candidates can be those in MD forensic medicine or MD in hospital administration. <clears throat> University of Manchester is offering a three-year full term or a six-year part-term distance learning course of PhD in bioethics and medical jurisprudence. It is based on the presumption that national, regional, local governments and organizations and authorities have realized the need for a highly trained people in healthcare, ethics, and law. The program includes innovative schedule for a publication-based PhD. The candidate would have the opportunity to work closely with the Center for Social Ethics and Policy, UK. University world over are offering courses in bioethics. Coming Medical University China offers PhD in medical jurisprudence. Law Institute India offers PG in Diploma in Medical Jurisprudence. PG certificate course in Forensic and Medical Jurisprudence is being offered by D.Y. Patel Law College affiliated to Pune University. And this is recognized by government of Maharashtra and approved by Bar Council of India. Graduation in any discipline is the minimum eligible requirement for pursuing this course. DM in Forensic Pathology. 
It is not a true speciality of forensic medicine. The basic degree required is MD in pathology. However, this can be thought of. And if the learned colleagues put their mind together, the course can emerge. Histopathology is a part of the curriculum of MD forensic medicine. We all take practical examinations of the candidate, both in his ability to stain and examine unstained slides, as well as examine and interpret findings of stained slides. Hence, this super speciality can also be thought of. The eligible candidates would be MD in forensic medicine, MD in pathology. Society of Apothecaries London offers DMJ in pathology. In US of A, if you would want to specialize in forensic pathology, you have to first have a degree in pathology and only then you can specialize in forensic pathology. Other fields, we can have, we can think of super specialization in forensic dentistry, forensic radiology, forensic psychiatry, etc. However, again, as I have stressed earlier, the basic PG degree required is not forensic medicine, but the main subject. But we do teach the undergraduates and postgraduates regarding the reading of x-rays for ossification centers, fractures, any such anomalies. Hence, radiology can also be thought for super specialization. Many dental institutes have started PG course in forensic dentistry, but the main degree required is BDS and not MBBS. Government of Maharashtra has now allowed forensic dentists to be appointed in the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology on contract basis. Now we do have one DM degree in uh, of forensic and medical toxicology running in the country. This should give us an impetus to work upon and think of other specialization, other fields where we can super specialize. But we have to first and foremost work sincerely hard to improve the condition of our mortuaries, which are our OTs, as well as we have to improve our own stature, stature in the society and create a respective niche for ourselves. Thank you. These are my references.